A day after Barack Obama announces his support for same-sex marriage, the Washington Post publishes an article about Romney bullying an effeminate student when he was in prep school. So this story is making its rounds on the internet. Everyone is talking about it. And um, I have to say, uh, the 11 page article was really interesting because it kind of gives you an idea of where Romney comes from, right? Mm -hmm. The environment that he was educated in and the type of behavior that was deemed acceptable, right? Now, five students who actually went to school with him uh, shared their story with the Washington Post, right? And all of them shared their stories in separate rooms and you know, this, it, it all kind of came together. So you can tell that they're not just lying and they're not bashing him. And I should also note that all of the people who contributed to this story uh, also have different political backgrounds. So they're not all Democrats. Democrats, uh, a few of them are Republicans, and that's an important thing to keep in mind because this isn't politically motivated. Um, but what's really interesting is uh, there was one case where there was a student that Mitt Romney believed was gay. Okay, he hadn't come out, but Romney believed he was gay, and one day he came to school with, I guess, a haircut that was too feminine for Mitt Romney. It was like, you know, draped over one of his eyes, and he also dyed his hair blonde. Well, Romney had a problem with that, so he got a few of his friends to hold the student down and cut his hair, which is unbelievable to me, that that was acceptable. Mm -hmm. There was absolutely no consequence for what he did. And a few of the students who participated in that action you know, said that they regretted it. Uh, they spoke to the student. His name was John Lauber, uh, and they apologized to him. Um, but you know, something like that is so traumatic for someone who's in high school or sure. prep school. Mm -hmm. So um, in another case, there was a professor who was, um, you know, he wasn't blind, but he had a hard time seeing. And Romney pretended as if he was opening or holding the door for uh, the professor, but he didn't. And the professor, like, walked into the door, which is so disrespectful. This one so is even, cruel. yeah, it's more unbelievable to me even than the first story. Because that's your educator. Look, this article, which went into great detail about mm -hmm. the environment of this school, um, talks about how it was really, it was hardcore when it came to academics. It was a very strict school. You know, some of the educators would come into like the dorm rooms and, you know, wear white gloves and check for dust, right? It seems like such a strict environment. And then you have this little, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to try not to use mean language, but <laughs> you have someone like Mitt Romney doing something so cruel to an educator there, and there's absolutely no consequence for it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it partially makes me question in a way, I think it's difficult because we're looking at these kind of isolated events in the context of 2012, and this happened in 1965. And a part of me wonders what was the kind of climate then? How acceptable was it for people to be basically homophobic out loud? I wonder if the teachers didn't do anything about this because they agreed with the position. They looked at, you know, they looked the other way because they said, oh, the boys will be boys and they're horse playing and I'm not going to protect this, you know, this child who's effeminate or who may be homosexual because I disagree with this too. You know, it was a completely different climate that doesn't by any stretch excuse the right. behavior, but it makes me wonder if that's why this kind of behavior was much more accepted at the time. At the time, his father was the head of American Motors mm -hmm. and I get the sense that Everyone on that campus, including the educators, knew that he was a privileged child, right? And as a result, they looked the other way as he was bullying, um, you know, uh, students, as he was doing cruel things to educators. It's, it's kind of what you see today, where if you have a, a powerful background, if you have money, people are always willing to look the other way because you are seen as like the upper class that can get away with murder. And at some point, you may be able to help me out. You right. know what I mean? And I don't want to cross you. And I, I think you see it kind of travel up into his adulthood because when you look at some of the decisions that he makes, some of the conversations that he has in public arenas, you know, when there are cameras on him, he knows he's being watched. He's so out of touch. Mm -hmm. He's just so not in the know with what normal people are struggling with. Right, and that's actually the best point because when I read this article, I got the sense that he was raised in this bubble, this bubble of wealth luxury, uh, being able to do whatever you want and never being held accountable for your actions. And that has kind of been illustrative of his own policy ideas when it comes to the financial sector, right? Oh, let Wall Street get away with murder. You know, we have to create jobs. We have to allow Wall Street to get away with what they're doing because they're the job creators. You know, mm -hmm. he, I honestly think that even though there's evidence proving that that's wrong, he has grown up in this bubble 
where he has convinced himself that it's right. He's yeah. completely oblivious. He has to his own they're... evidence, you know, that he can he can look at. And also, yeah. what's interesting is he grew up in a, a, another bubble on top of that, and that was this kind of Mormon bubble. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of people shy away from really talking about this. We've got to be really careful not to be offensive. But I was raised Mormon, mm -hmm. so I feel like I can kind of speak about this with a little bit of authority. I left the church when I was 14. Um, half of my family is still in the church, wow. and so I grew up in that environment. And I know this kind of very smart, very tactful way to raise a child to be somewhat bigoted, mm -hmm. to be somewhat um, intolerant, but also have a heart full of love for your fellow man, you know, and you just, you grow up never thinking that these viewpoints could be wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just well accepted and you're in this bubble that is the Mormon community. Mormon kids hang out with Mormon kids, you know, and, and also you see his wealthy kids were hanging out with wealthy kids. And not only, I think, does this inform his policies, policy decisions when it comes to e economic policy and foreign policy, mm -hmm. I think it really informs a lot of his decisions when it comes to these, you know, more social, social or third issues. rail issues. Right, okay, so JR has videos of Romney responding to this Washington Post article. Let's watch. I played a lot of pranks in high school, uh, and, uh, and and they described some that, uh, well, you just say to yourself that back in high school, you know, I, I, I did some uh, dumb things, and, and if anybody was... Uh, was hurt by that or offended by obviously I apologize. Uh, they talk about uh, a prank that could have gone on in high school with uh, with a fr with a guy named John Lauber, who they say that you and a couple of his friends, who this guy was a thought to be uh, homosexual, uh, cut his hair, pin him down and, and cut his hair. Do you remember any of this? You know, I don't, I don't remember that incident. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, I, I certainly don't uh, believe that I or I can't speak for other people, of course, but thought the fellow was, was homosexual. Uh, that 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 was the furthest thing from our minds back in the 1960s. But, uh, uh, so that was that was not the case. But uh, uh, but as to pranks that were played back then, I, I don't remember them all. But again, you know, high school days, if I did stupid things, so I, uh, I I'm afraid that I, I gotta I gotta say sorry for it. Wow, where's the gavel? Like this is a total like moment where we would pound the gavel. Guilty. Like you, I don't recall. Like that's what people say when they're testifying, uh, and, and they don't want to admit to the crime, so they just say, "I don't remember." 